I do have for you is, what is the 2% way? Yeah, the 2% way was a philosophy that I adopted from my football coach at Florida State, Mickey Andrews, my defense coordinator. He would challenge me and my teammates every day to get 2% better on the field, our backpedaling, our ability to high point the football, our ability to disguise blitz packages. Uh, he'd want us to just take these small steps every single day in practice. And he put it in this phrase, in this term, 2%. Which made it manageable, which made it palatable. Uh, and he'd go into the locker room after practice and write on the whiteboard, hey, did Myron Roll get 2% better? And the guys on the team would have to vote on it. So it was a way to keep us accountable. I took that methodology, extrapolated to life. And so that any chance encounter that I have, any book that I read, any person I meet, any experience I have, honestly, I try to grab 2% from that moment and add it to my own personal journey, take small incremental steps every single day towards getting better. And it's been my ethos ever since college. And I've used it in different walks of my life from my personal life as a husband, as a father, to my professional life as a neurosurgeon, to my community life as a mentor and a community advocate. It's been uh, it's been a winning strategy for sure. Now, when Coach Andrews uh, came to you and every day and said, hey, did you get 2% better? Was there ever a time once or twice that you said, not today, coach? Absolutely. How did that go? Absolutely. Not only did I say it, my teammates would say it. My teammates were, hey, you know, roll, he loafed on that play or roll, you know, wasn't too sharp on his uh, his reads today. That would challenge me. And, and, I, and honestly, the, com the competitor in me, uh, I've been competing in sports my entire life. I'm the last of five boys. We all come from the Bahamas. My brothers wouldn't allow me to eat first at the table. They wouldn't give me certain things. Get, they wouldn't give me an opportunity to play PlayStation until they were done. I was competing for everything. I had to be good or great just to stay on level with my older brothers. And so when I would hear and feel that I wasn't as good as I needed to be that day, when I did not get better, when I did not grab that 2% of increase, it would encourage me to one, study more film, eat more healthy foods, make sure that I was hydrated for the next day, and cannot wait to get the next day going. Not, oh man, I got to go to practice tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be so terrible. Oh, it's hot in Tallahassee, Florida. I said, I cannot wait to start this day. God, give me breath so I can have this day, so I can go back and dominate and get even better tomorrow because I'm ready for it. You think I can't do it? Let me show you how. And so that kind of feeling, that motivation, even gives me the same sort of pump uh right now when i'm you know in operating uh, the operating situations and let's say an outcome doesn't happen like i want it to uh i cannot wait to do that case again to another patient so i can have a better opportunity another opportunity uh, to have a better outcome to change some things around and make sure uh that we're doing the best for that patient their family uh it's exciting it's a good way to think about continual growth, never feeling satisfied, never feeling plateaued, but always feeling like there is a way up. And, uh, and I love the last it. thing I would say is that the 2% way process is not only for goals like physical or mental health, even though those are incredibly important, but it's also, um, it can also be personal, right? It also can be very personal. Uh, for me as a new father, I have two sets of twins. Um, the youngest set are one years old. The oldest set are two and a half or so right now. Uh, I, I, I had to learn how to change diapers. I had to learn how to be a more attentive dad when I'm around. Let's put down the football game that I'm watching and let's focus on these children so that they get daddy time. They get their priority, right? They can look me in the eye and we can work together and, and count numbers together and look at shapes together and figure these things out. You know, how do I work myself into a space where I can, you know, be the man that I want my children to look up to? So it's, it has so much versatility, this process, and I've used it and I go back to it all the time. Uh, and, and doing it as a father has been fantastic. I love being a father. It's the best job I've ever had, uh, better than any interception I could have on the field or any tumor I could take out of someone's brain. Uh, it, it feels good to see the growth in, in my child rearing uh, and seeing my kids respond to that. And my wife obviously appreciate it too. So it's been, it's been great. The question I really wanted to start off was, where do you find the time to write a book with everything going on in your life? How does that, where do you find the time? Yeah, you know, uh, I had a lot of these thoughts and stories uh, stored up uh, in my mind and uh, in different Word documents that I would keep uh, with me. 
And I, I just knew that, you know, when there was a moment to write, give me eight months of some solid time in between surgery, in between call schedules, I would just, you know, meticulously get after almost to using the 2% way process to actually write the book, right? So going through editors, reading different books, and listening to how my voice should sound as comparison to other people who have similar sort of ideologies when it comes to motivation and helping individuals. So we carved out the time. I had a good team around me uh, from a publishing house in uh, Zondervan, HarperCollins Christian Publishing, to my brother, to my wife, to my literary agent. Everyone sort of allowed me the space to, to get better, to think through my thoughts, uh, and to put it on paper and to go through it different iterations of how I wanted it to uh, be presented to the general public. And I think it came out pretty nicely. It's been well received by a lot of people. And I, I, I enjoyed writing it. Now, is there a, tr a trick or maybe not a trick, but a strategy to prioritize the time to get all these things done to achieve, I guess, whatever goals you have set in mind, is there a strategy or does it just come natural? You know, it's a, it's a lot about the support you have. You know, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be supported, right? You have to have people around you in the right place, strategically placed uh, to buffer you and to help you, right? One, you have a group of people who speak life into you, encourage you, talk you up, you know, say, hey, you got it. You're doing well. Sort of proud of you. Inject you with that goodness. Inject you with that sort of uplifting spirit, right? You have those people. Then you have the the workers, the ones who move things around, so that you can have the time, space, and energy uh, to do surgery, right? Keeping the main thing, the main thing, to do brain and spine surgery, but then also have the space to write this book. And then you need the people who have the access to getting that work out and into the public, out and into the finishing steps. So you need the people with the juice. You gotta add the, the movers, right? The ones who are able to, to, to make it happen and really open up doors for you. And those are individuals who have to believe in you, uh, you have to sell your vision. And uh, and so I think it is the team, the team, the team. I come from playing football my entire life and I believe in the team. I believe if I have the A gap, you have the B gap. He has a C gap. We're all going to be there at the right time so we can stop that ball carrier and make the play next down, second and nine, and we're ready to suit up and do it again. So I believe it's it's about you know having a, a structure, having a team, having discipline, and putting the right folks around you uh, for you to win. similarities between football and neuroscience like as far as preparation as far as performance i know yeah you you got it right i mean it's high performance high stakes you know one you win a football game uh the other one you might win a life right so i mean there's a there's a difference in the stakes of it all but i think football has trained me and informed me to be a better neurosurgeon today the discipline it takes to play football in the national football league same discipline necessary uh, to wake up at 4.30 every morning, round on your patients, see them, examine them, write a note, staff them with your attendings, your bosses, go to the operating room for, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours, go and round on your patients at the end of the day and make sure that everybody's tucked away and go do the same thing every day uh, or six days out of the week. Uh, communication. You know, as a safety, I'm talking to everyone, strong left, strong right, tight ends wide, lining up over here. They're bringing in this kind of person now. They're likely going to run this kind of play. I'm communicating with our staff, our nurses, our device representatives, our anesthesiologists. Hey, look, this is the case. We can have some blood loss if we get into the sinus. Let's make sure we don't. Let's have some preparation, uh, a plan in place. If that happens, let's have the blood bank ready. Let's have a typing screen ready. Let's get everything sorted. I'm talking and communicating, moving things around like I'm a safety on the football field. But I think the thing that really, really helped me the most uh, in football was the ability to be flexible and adaptable, right? The ability to change and adjust. I remember we were playing the Florida Gators uh, my senior or my junior year at FSU. And we were struggling. We were struggling. Tim Tebow, they were just driving the ball down the field on us. We had practiced all week to play them man to man. We had to adjust at halftime to a zone coverage. And that was so different. We didn't practice it. We didn't know how to do it. But look, fundamentals, get it done. We got to adjust, got to adapt on the fly. Be ready, be flexible. For me in neurosurgery, I am ready to take out brain tumors to fix the form spines and do all that. But when COVID hit, neurosurgery stopped. And we had to actually had to be ED doctors. We had to take in patients and learn how to intubate them and flip them prone and do all the things that emergency medical doctors would do. And so the ability to be adaptable, to adjust, to be flexible, I learned that in football. And it's been very, very helpful in my career now as a neurosurgeon. Do you have to motivate yourself differently now between football and surgery? 
actually, no, I, I, I still feel the same level of motivation uh, and still take the same steps. I pray all the time. This is my 2% way process of getting ready for, for surgery, praying all the time, listening to the right music. I have some pump up music I listen to, some reggae. I'm from the Bahamas, so I like listening to some island music. Uh, I visualize myself. What am I going to do? I, I, put, I close my eyes and say, okay, I know where the patient's going to be. I know where anesthesia is going to be. I know where my monitor is going to be. I know where my devices are going to be. I know what hand I'm going to use to make this resection and to move this tissue here and there. I think about it just like I thought about making interceptions or disguising my blitz packages so I can go down and make a sack on a quarterback. So some of the same preparatory steps in football I'm using now to motivate myself to get better in the operating room. That 2% way process has not left me. And uh, it's exciting to use it every day. And I'm glad I wrote about it in the book because I hope people can, can gain from it and take uh, some of those strategies uh, and apply it to their own life. What do people get wrong in trying to improve themselves? I think what people get wrong sometimes in uh, that small incremental growth uh, of improvement daily is they get distracted. You know, I think your eyes, your ears, your mouth, I think your heart can take you and move you off the mark a lot of times. And if you're looking around and seeing what people are doing on Instagram, on Twitter, in your generation, you may think you're not doing it fast enough. You're not getting it enough. You're not looking the way you want to look. You're not having the money you want to have. You're not achieving the goals you want to achieve. You're not getting into the schools you want to get into. But you're not sure what's in their story. You're not sure what God has for them. You're not sure what's going on in their lane. You're not sure that's even real, right? You can compare yourself to everybody else, but the 2% way process quiets the background noise, allows you to focus on your journey, what's in your lane. How can you get a little bit better every day? Walking and running on your pace, your beat, right? Your rhythm. You're not going anybody else's. You're doing it the way you ought to do it. And taking those small winnable steps every day, that's exciting for not only you to achieve your goal, but it's also exciting that your body is now releasing these hormones like dopamine from your limbic lobe to say, this is a reward. This is a reward for you getting a little bit better today. And that step you took was a major improvement. You were better today than you were yesterday. And tomorrow you're going to do it more. And the next day you're going to do it more. And next day you're going to do it more. So if we limit the distractions, limit the looking around, limit the hearing, limit the things that can get us off the mark. Uh, we as, as a generation, we as a people, we as a society, I think can continue to progress and make good steps forward and reach our goals. And that's that's uh, what we want to do. That's what we want to see people do. I mean, not everyone's going to be a road scholar or an NFL player or a neurosurgeon, but they can be successful in their own right. They can be difference makers in their own right, in their homes, in their communities, at their workplace, in their spiritual life, or however they want to take it. I think it's important to give people the strategy and the formula to do it in a 2% way does just that. Without giving a spoiler alert to the book, what would you give step one to every person? Say, hey, here's, if you want to start improving your life tomorrow, do this first. Well, I would say, uh, without, you know, sort of going too deep into it, um, I say the 2% the way would, would talk about having a an achievable goal and writing it down. You know, there's something about your cortical spinal tract from your brain down to your arm putting pen to paper and saying, look, this is who I want to be in a week. This is what I want to achieve in two weeks. This is what I want to achieve in six months. But putting down that goal matters because it becomes real. You conceptualize it, you internalize it, and now you have a metric. You have something to target, right? That is the first step, right? And we can get into the next steps after that. But the first step is actualizing how you want to achieve this goal. And the beautiful thing about it is even if you don't achieve that goal, even if you're not more punctual, even if you don't communicate with your mother more because that's a goal you want to do, even if you know, you're know you not cleaning your house as much as you want to because that's a goal or your body's not looking like you want it to look, even if you don't get there at the time you want it to, the process of getting better every day is good. The process is positive. The process is forward leaning. And, and in that moment of getting a little bit better every day, you may see other things in the process that may arise, other opportunities that may jump up at you and other ways that that 2% way and the work that you put into achieving that goal uh, could be used. And so it's such, it's such a way, it's such a good way, in my opinion, to minimize, like conceptualize things, bring it down to a manageable, palatable level and make it real for you, make it digestible for you. Uh, so you don't feel overwhelmed that you have to take over the world tomorrow. You don't have to. If someone's telling you that, they're not telling you the truth. You can take it in small steps. The 2% way does that. You 
mentioned earlier about, I guess, the teamwork, the team around you, whether it be the publishers, your football team, your operating team. How important is it having the right staff around you? I mean, just to get you to, uh, to make the right decisions. Uh, for example, what I was thinking was when it came down to your, I guess, senior season, when it was either Florida State or Oxford, you could have, someone could have easily told you, you could always go to Oxford a year or two from now, or, but you're not going to get your senior season back. And that could have changed the alternate course of your life. How do you know to take the right decision, take what your instincts are, and just uh, like have the right team or be able to take the right advice? That was a long question. I hope it made sense. No, absolutely. It definitely makes sense. You know, I, I think there's something about uh, having an introspective look at who you are and your core, right? If you know your core, if you know who you are at the center of it all, then the voices that you enlist and solicit to speak life into you will touch on those things. And if they're not, then thank you for the advice. I appreciate your care, you know, but you know, I'm going to move in this direction. You have to go to the fundamentals of who you are. When all of it is boiled down in the Bahamas, we have this saying called pot cake. Pot cake is um, the bottom of the pot after the rice is all made and you eat up all the peas and rice. Rice is a huge staple in the Bahamas. And once you finish it, it's at the bottom of the pot. There's some black rice that's really saturated and in, in, in all the juice and the grease. It tastes really good, but it's called pot cake. So once you get down to the pot cake, everything is bowled away. Everything is gone. Who are you? And if you know that, if you're true to that, and if you listen to that, then the voices that you employ who speak to that, hey, Myron, you've always been a student athlete. You've always put student before athlete. You've always talked about your intellectual prowess as being something that's important to you. You told me about Ben Carson inspiring you to be a neurosurgeon. What's going to help you be a neurosurgeon? Is it playing football and getting your head beaten up for 10, 12, 13 years? Or is it going to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar right now and how, how having that propel you to your future, right? Having those sort of people around you to talk life into you, it matters. It's good to listen to that, and it's good to know exactly what your constitution stands for, what it says. Even when you wake up in the morning, when you open your eyes, you know exactly who you ought to be and who you are and who this world needs you to be. And if you have people who speak life into that and can speak to that, it's really important and very, very helpful. And I've I've had that my entire life. I'm, I'm blessed uh, to have those sorts of people around matters. Now, what was one great piece of advice that you were given maybe back in early on that still applies to whatever it is you're doing now, whether it was sports, whether it's medicine, whether it's family life. Is there one piece that maybe you didn't think about the time and that just still applies and really still? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, my daddy used to tell me, um, you know, uh, shoot, shoot for the stars. Cause if, if you miss, uh, or sorry, shoot for the sun. Cause if you miss, you're still amongst the stars, right? Like, like go as high as you can. Like think of, think of your, your journey as one where you can rise and go onward and upward uh, as high as you want if you're a good person, if you're a good leader, if you're a good steward of the things that have been blessed upon you in this life, if you treat people well, uh, if you have the right folks around you and you have that opportunity, if that door opens, you got to shoot for it, go. And if you don't make it, it's okay. You're not a failure. <laughs> you didn't let anyone down. You're still okay. And you're still moving in the right direction because you're still really, really high. And you can still be very successful and you can still influence and impact a lot of people. So it's setting the goals high, thinking high, looking up always, leaning forward, always moving in a direction uh, that will help other people and bring other people along with you. I love when my daddy told me that because it made me feel that the work that we're doing on this earth, um, you know, isn't just contingent on being the absolute number one, the absolute best. Nobody can ever touch you and what you do. It made me feel like there was room and flexibility to be great and to, to miss at times, um, but to feel, feel good about the process and the journey. Like you see from both, both perspectives, like as an athlete, as a doctor, like how important is it like you said, to maintain physical health, mental health, and how are we lacking in it somehow? Yeah, I think um, physical health is and mental health are, are, are two important aspects of, of who we are. It allows us to enjoy the things we love in life, uh, enjoy our families, it allows us to integrate with our communities, it allows us to be a difference maker. You, you, you cannot be 
a uh, player on the world stage like William Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon said, if you are sidelined based on your health, if you're sidelined based on a sedentary life that you have chosen to take partake in based on the substances you've decided to, uh, to, to intake. I mean, you, you have to get up, be mobile, get moving uh, because your energy uh, is needed and uh, your ability to mobilize and activate your own self and others around you. Uh, they see it and it matters. Uh, you know, I life is so precious and I see it every day in neurosurgery where one decision or, you know, one bleed or, or one stroke can just completely disrupt the life that one person had. Uh, they may not be here tomorrow. And so I appreciate the, the, uh, the sanctity of life. I appreciate how blessed we are to have every day. I appreciate the fact that uh, health needs to be a priority so that we can avoid those situations. Or if we get into those situations, it's it's a little bit easier to bounce back from those if you go into a condition with less pre-morbid conditions, less pre-morbid disease, right? If you happen to have some sort of devastating neurological disease, the people who have better prognosis are the ones who go into it healthier, right? So your healthier mind, your healthier body, you know, you set yourself up to win. Uh, and it's exciting to to be able to talk about it. It's exciting to be able to preach on it. It's exciting to now go from a sport that I played my entire life, which kept me healthy, and now be in the medical profession where I'm able to advocate for better mental health, better physical health, and seeing us um, improve in, in, in all these dimensions. How does Dr. Roll stay football ready when he has surgery now as a profession? Hydration, uh, proper sleep. And sleep's tough to come by when you're operating for a long time and you're on call 24 hours sometimes, but certainly making sure I'm taking the right things in my body, making sure I'm staying well hydrated, making sure I'm getting good sleep, uh, making sure that, um, you know, the diet that I have is well balanced, making sure that I have the energy, making sure that I get some workouts in too, uh, to allow my muscles to stay strong, right? Not only to be able to stand upright for the eight hour surgeries, uh, but also to maintain my my mental acumen and my mental sharpness during those times, because, you know, it, it, we see it in surgery that bad complications occur towards the, the, the 11th hour of the surgery, the last 30 minutes, right? The last 20 minutes when you're almost done, right? You feel the finish line approaching and you're tired. Your mind sort of goes a little bit, just like football. I mean, when I play football, you'd make the most mistakes in the fourth quarter when you're tired and you're not thinking correctly, right? And you allow your fundamentals to get a little loose, uh, to get less technical. Uh, but this is the time to really lock in. And so I really trained my mind and trained my body to focus in, laser in even more uh, when we get to the end of our surgeries. And it's been very helpful for me. Last question. The 2% way, if you were to give someone advice to get them started, or restart on their fitness journey to get back into shape, get back into health. What's the 2% way to getting started? The 2% way I think to getting started with, with your health is uh, having an accountability buddy, uh, having somebody check in on you and make sure you're doing right. Even coming with you as you go work out, go to the gym. I think it's finding ways that, that match your schedule, you know, being creative, not everyone's 2% process to better health is the same. So yours may be looking on YouTube or looking on the internet to see different exercises that work for you, finding something that you truly enjoy, whether it's playing basketball, roller skating, just getting out walking, uh, being in a class, are you better as a solo work workout person, or are you better in a group? So finding what's your rhythm, not going with sort of what everyone's doing. Let's see what you can do. Uh, is it affordable for you? Can you afford those expensive Peloton bikes? They're great, but they're kind of expensive. Or can you afford something uh, that's maybe not as expensive, but can provide some similar results? So it's really knowing who you are, fitting it into your schedule, being creative and strategic with it, having an accountability buddy, sticking to it, tracking your progress every month, every six months, every year, and going for it, getting after it. And trust me, you'll see the results. That 2% process, small incremental gains, you'll feel better uh, by taking those small steps. It's really, really important in our mental health, physical health, and everything that we do during our, during our, uh, during our lives if we're trying to achieve uh, a certain specific goal, a certain metric. It's going to be great. Uh -huh.